Today we are going to talk about endometriosis, which is where you would find that uh, you have the uterus. You have the endometrial lining. Endometriosis comes from endometrium. Endometrium is the inner lining of the uterus. Endometriosis usually happen when the tissue that you're supposed to be found inside your uterus grows in other areas like you'd find that in the abdominal cavity, you find that around the intestines, you'd find that also in the where you have the diaphragm and we're going to see some of the things that are speculated to cause this. And also, do you know that you can also become pregnant when you're still having endometriosis? And most of the time you'd find that um, diagnosis of the same usually happen just by chance you have gone to see your doctor because of another thing totally different but then they discover when for example they're doing their exam or maybe you are going through a surgery they discover tissue in a place where it's not supposed to be so we're going to look at that and uh, we're also going to look at the treatment method some of the things that are usually done depending on whether you want to become pregnant or not so we're going to also cover that and also you're going to see the risk factors and some of the speculated causes like i mentioned now Let's go to now the major cause or the major indicator of endometriosis. You'd find that the biggest of all is pain. So you'll find discomfort mostly due to one of the things, which is now this tissue is growing in areas where it's not supposed to be. So your immune system, while patrolling, to find something or a tissue in a place where it's not supposed to be. So the biggest thing it can do is just to react to that, try to remove that thing out of that place. And that's where the pain and discomfort comes in for. Now we have also the, um, what do you call this, adhesion. Now, and also scars. Scars will come from um, the reaction of your immune system with uh, the tissue itself. But then we have additions. Where you do find that maybe you have two organs, which are like this, and then there is a formation of that tissue somewhere here. And then because it's big, it makes both of them stick together. So the addition can make uh, some of the organs of the body become very uncomfortable. And that's where also the discomfort will come from. That's where you're going to find most of the symptoms that you're going to get. Now, the overall complication when it comes to endometriosis is the pain and discomfort like we've mentioned. And also the pinnacle of all is infertility. In as much as I mentioned, because you can also become pregnant when you still have endometriosis because we've have we've seen cases where someone was discovered that they have endometriosis because they were going through a CS, meaning that they were already pregnant, but then they have endometriosis. But we have a higher chance of being infertile because of this condition. Now, depending on how severe this condition is, in most cases, you're going to find that um, there is no relationship between the severity of the symptoms with the severity of the disease. So you'd find that you have some very few specks in the body, but uh, it's very painful. You have excruciating pain, or you have so many of them, but then you don't feel anything. And remember by then, as some of the things, like we said, we said you can get additions, we can get pain, you also can get, um, the attachment can be in so many other areas of the body. You can also get ovarian cysts due to the same condition, but then, like I said, it can be by a chance. Like someone uh, discovered this because they had gone to the doctor because of another thing. They've gone for just maybe on observation or maybe they are getting a discomfort. Then imaging was done. Then they discover that they have endometriosis or you, when they were having a, maybe an open surgery. So the doctor discovered that there's a tissue that is resembling what is supposed to be in the endometrial wall. So that tissue is taken to the laboratory and confirmation is made. But like I said, we have several things that can be contributing factors. Some are just speculations. There is no direct link between the causation of the endometriosis and the actual having the endometriosis. So there is no link in between. There is just an observation of a certain correlation between them, one of which is genetic predisposition, where you find that in a certain family, they have a family history of the same, meaning that this is in their genes. So they have a predisposition, and this one becomes a little bit hard to even manage because you'd find that even after the removal of the same tissue, it comes back because you still have the factors that usually contribute to getting the same. So most of the times you would find that um, the doctor will do everything to make sure that you're comfortable all along. And in most cases, you need to adjust your lifestyle to accommodate the fact that you might end up having the same thing forever. It's actually very important for you to know that there is no known cause 
so there is no actual known cause so the doctors will not know scientists have not yet known the actual cause but like i said you're going to go through some of the predisposing factors like the one that we've mentioned you might have um, a family history of the same and there is another one which is an old speculated cause which is retrograde menstruation it's a kind of a relationship between them Retrograde menstruation happens when now. Now, in a normal day, in a normal menstruation cycle, you're supposed to, now after shedding the wall, the blood is supposed to go to your cervix, out through your, uh, your vagina, and out of your body. But then we have instances where, when especially you're sleeping, or maybe you're in battle, or maybe just whatever you're doing, blood might, instead of going through uh, to your cervix and out of your body through vagina, it might go up to your, you know, you have a tube, the fallopian tube. And... It goes, no, between the fallopian tube, you have the tubes here, and you have the ovaries here, there is a space in between that place. So, and um, that's why most of the time, like you remember when you're talking about um, ectopic pregnancy, like I said, from the ovary, an egg can fall down, okay, not down per se, but it can fall into abdominal cavity when you are talking about the various types of um, um, weird pregnancies. So there is a space in between the fallopian tube because it's kind of this, there's a, a funnel that looks like this and then you have the ovary like this one here. So there's a space in between because when you're ovulating, it kind of, the egg is usually sucked and then you have the cilia that helps in uh, now pushing the egg forward. Now, that's digressing. Now, what happens is now blood is coming through your fallopian tube, but then it falls into your abdominal cavity. And this is a speculation that it might go, and because it contains the endometrial cells, it might establish itself in the abdominal cavity and cause the discomfort that comes with the endometriosis. Another speculation is when you're pregnant as a lady, there is a developing fetus in you. Now, during this period, uh, we have the movement of the embryonic cells in the fetus to various areas. This is what will form the, uh, the ears, this is what will form the hair, this is what will form the legs and all that. So the cells are just migrating. We have those that will come and form the endometrial wall and they might be lodged in other areas, in tiny bits. And this can lead to the formation of the endometrial tissue in those areas which are not inside the uterus when the baby is born and when they get to their maturity. So this is another speculation, so it's not a confirmed case. So it's only that we have a correlation or a theory that looks true because, yeah, there is some truth in that. Also, we have uh, surgical procedures where, for example, you've gone for USCS. And uh, then, because you know, they'll have to cut through to your uterus and remove whatever is inside there. So some of the cells can just go out and get maybe in your abdominal cavity and establish an infection, not actually an infection, establish itself there, causing endometriosis. So it's a speculation, like I said. We have more risks that we're going to cover, but before you get there, we have the lymphatic system, which can also transport the cells to other areas of the body. That's why you might find that the cells, the endometrial cells, are establishing themselves in so many other areas, or in an area which is so remote and not directly linked to now the uterus. Us. Now, let's go to the risks. The first one is um, when your periods start very early. So this is already a disorder. So you find that um, a lady is getting, or a girl is getting a menses around 11 years, 12 years around that point. So you have an increased risk. So this is not a cause, it's just a, a factor which have, have, have been seen to be a contributing factor. We also have those people who usually get their menopause late. Like instead of getting it around 45 to 50 years, you find that they are getting their menopause around 60 years. So you also have an increased risk of getting the same. We also have low body mass, meaning that you are lighter, you are body mass index is different, is lower, so it's a risk. We also have family history, like I mentioned, it's a risk also, and we have those people usually get very heavy menstrual period, so it's still a contributing factor. It's not a clear, it's a risk, it's not a contributing factor, although a risk can also contribute. Also, those people with very short cycle, you run the risk of getting the same, but uh, most of these things are usually beyond your control, and like you said, there is no known cause of endometriosis, so anyone is at a risk of getting uh, this condition.
Now, how do we treat this? One, it can just disappear without doing anything. You might even not even notice that you had it because maybe you started having maybe some discomfort because you had it and then it disappeared and uh, the discomfort just went away. So you might not even notice. So sometimes it can even disappear with you even not knowing that you even had it in the first place. But we have pregnancy. But remember, like I said in the previous video, is uh, pregnancy kind of pauses everything. So you're not getting your cycle, so there is no development of the tissues. If you have a lesser severe case of the same and you become pregnant, it become bearable because you now don't have to share the uterine lining at any point until you give birth. So during this period, it's kind of like, we, like when we're talking about fibroids, it's kind of they have been paused. So the hormones are stable. So the balance between estrogen and progesterone is in a level where there is no demoration of the uterine lining because they want to maintain the pregnancy. And the same case, you're not going to have the same case. Oh, it becomes bearable. You might still continue having the pain, but it's bearable because now you're not shedding the wall. So let's go to the drugs. One depending on whether you're planning to become pregnant, the choice might be dependent on several factors that will be based on your preferences. We have birth control methods, which like we said about the pregnancy, they're supposed to pause. And most of the drugs that you're going to use here are hormonal. So they'll prevent you from shedding the wall. So you're not going to get your periods. And this is what will uh, minimize the pain that you're going to get. And also, the, it's going to minimize you building the wall. And uh, by doing so, you're not going to suffer from you know, the information that will come from the cells of the body fighting the tissue in a place where it's not supposed to be in. We also have DNRH, which is gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Now, if we block this one, it's like, for example, um, uh, I'm trying to look for a good analogy. Now you have a router in the house which is applying internet via Wi-Fi in the house. Now um, you can switch off your phone, the Wi-Fi, and you're not communicating. You're not getting messages. You're not accessing the internet. But you can also go to the main line and cut the cable coming to your router. If you cut that, this is exactly what we are talking about here, blocking the GNRH, which usually instructs um, other organs to produce the hormones, the luteinizing hormone, the follicle stimulating hormones, or the hormones that you have, the estrogen and progesterone. So the hormones which are usually involved in the cycle, they are blocked, so they are not produced, meaning that you're going to not have that. But remember, you're not going to become pregnant if you're not going to get that. But we have um, other alternatives, like for example, you can have um, IVF, which is in vitro fertilization, or you can just go and procure a surrogate mother. You also have painkillers. Remember, NSAIDs uh, usually help in inhibiting the prostaglandins. Remember, prostaglandins actually produced when you are close to shedding the wall because they help very much in uh, making the wall to contract and shake off the lining, which will come out in form of blood, which is the period that you experience at the beginning of each and every cycle. Now, if you take the NSAIDs, they're going to inhibit that, the prostaglandins, meaning you're not going to shed the wall. Or if you shed, it will be, it's going to be very minimal. And it's also going to limit the pain. And most of that will also limit the inflammation in the body. So you end up having some comfortable aspect of it. Although this is not um, a sustainable method. So you'll have to look for a... And this usually mostly applies when uh, you don't have a severe case of endometriosis. So you'll have to look for a lasting solution. Uh, because painkillers... Yeah, they are the best solutions here. Now let's go to mostly the surgical, which usually happen uh, to kind of give a better lasting solution. We have laparoscopy uh, procedures whereby they know, or well, after imaging, they discover that you have this somewhere, you have the lesion somewhere. So they insert a tube that has a camera and also has a channel for the, uh, the tools that they'll use to pluck off uh, the lesions that are the endometrial tissue. So they are going to remove that and this will give you the relief. But then um, we have chances that it might come back because we don't know the cause. It might come back or not. But mostly this is usually used when uh, you want to become pregnant. You don't want to expose yourself to hormones or use the painkillers. So this procedure will just remove the lesions. And they are going to make everything bearable and you can easily become pregnant. And after this, you can, it, it, it can buy time. 
or it can just totally disappear so it's one of the, it's actually better than using the hormonal methods but then uh, the risks and um, the benefits you're going to get from the a certain procedure will depend on uh, your use case or your individual level of um, this condition so you'll have to talk to your doctor and they're going to weigh which is the better option between uh, now that surgical using the drugs using the painkillers or having something that we call a uh, hysterectomy which is the removal of, of the whole womb